So we've seen how to compute the um, efficient labor market tightness and hence efficient unemployment rate in our basic matching model. Um, so, so, you know, in a sense, there are two limitations to uh, what we've done. So one of them is that, of course, the efficient unemployment rate and efficient tightness that we've computed are very specific to, you know, the narrow type of matching model that we've been um, focusing on. And then the other limitation, so one is that it applies to a, a kind of a narrow framework. The issue being that if that framework is not exactly accurate, if it's a slightly different framework that describes the world better, then our characterization may not be uh, valid um, or exactly valid. Um, the second thing is that um, we saw we obtained an implicit definition for the efficient labor market tightness. You remember what we find is that the ratio between unemployment and a rooftop producer ratio has to be equal to eta over one minus eta, where eta is the um, elasticity of the matching function. And that forces us to solve then for the efficient tightness using um, assumption about various functional forms that we need to, uh, to do to be able to compute the unemployment rate as a function of tightness, the recruiter producer ratio as a function of tightness. Um, so that's not very easy to um, implement in practice. So now what we're going to do is actually um, follow basically the same approach. You know, we're trying to find an efficient labor market tightness and efficient unemployment rate. What that means is that we're trying to find the tightness um, that solves the problem of a social planner uh, who is trying to maximize uh, welfare, but will solve that social planner's problem in a actually much more general framework. And while usually being more general leads to more complications and things that are harder to implement in practice, here it turns out that the generalization will actually clean things up. It will highlight the mechanisms, the forces that play better, and it will allow us to derive a characterization for the um, efficient labor market tightness that won't be implicit, but that will be explicit, that will actually depend on statistics that will be able to measure in the data. So it will be much more compelling. Um, so the idea is that we want to, uh, we want to compute the efficient labor market tightness, not just in our narrow matching model, but in fact in any model of the labor market that admits a beverage curve. So that's the idea here. We're going to compute the efficient unemployment rate in models that admit a beverage curve. So the matching model is one such model. We know that <coughs> in that model, there is indeed uh, a beverage curve, so that when unemployment is high, um, vacancies are low, and when unemployment is low, vacancies are high. Um, but there are many other models that have been developed that heal the beverage curve. So we we'll focus on this broad class of model, and we we'll call them beverage and model. Um, so, we're going to focus in models that admit uh, a beverage curve. That's going to be our key assumption. Um, so what that means is that uh, the vacancy uh, rate <coughs> can be written as a function of the unemployment rate, right? So you know a beverage curve is a negative relationship between vacancy and unemployment. Um, but so what that means is that if you're a social planner who lives in a beverage and model, your vacancy rate would be uh, basically a negative or decreasing function of the unemployment rate. Okay, um, so we'll assume that the vacancy rate v 
is a function v of u of the unemployment rate. And uh, so the key thing is that the function v of u uh, is going to be so first it has to be decreasing because we know that in the real world vacancies you know can be written as a decreasing function of the unemployment rate that's what the beverage curve shows and actually the other thing we know is that also that the beverage curve is uh, is convex and so that's actually important okay uh, so what that means is that if you're a central planner in that world and you pick the unemployment rate that through the beverage curve that will also determine your vacancy rate. Okay? Um, so what are examples of such model? Well, so one is as, as with of course we've seen uh, we have the matching model that we've been studying, so that, that would be one, but actually there are many other models. Um, that have this property. So, for instance, mis models of mismatch, which is something we won't study this semester, um, but you know that are um, fairly popular. These are other types of models that uh, admit a beverage curve. There are other models that are called stock flow matching models. Again, a different type of model that we are not going to delve into, but that people have studied and they also healed the beverage curve. All these models, uh, all these models have been described by the analysis that we do um, today. Um, so one advantage of this analysis is that it applies to many models, not just the matching model, which is good. The other advantage, of course, is that um, here, you know, we want to develop a technique, a method to compute the efficient labor market tightness, the efficient unemployment rate. And the motivation for that is that um, a lot of governments need to be able to compute efficient unemployment rate because they use that as a target for policy. So of course you want to have a method that is well applicable to the real world. And um, one advantage of what we're doing here is that the beverage curve is um, a feature of many labor markets. So we saw in the US there is a clearly defined beverage curve, but that's also true in many other labor markets in many other countries. So any policymaker who is based in a country where there is a beverage curve, and there are many such countries, um, then they'll be able to apply um, to apply the method. So that's a key thing to keep in mind that many countries have a beverage curve. So the method that we're going to see is applicable. 